Welcome to the Rosny College Electronics series of videos. In this video I'll be looking at debouncing and why it is necessary. If I have a flip-flop and it is triggered from a push button, for example. So a very good example of this is um, I have a read switch or a push button and I'm just going to draw it as a mechanical switch like so and if I want it to be a uh, rising edge then I need it so that when I press the button um, that this makes the input high otherwise the input is low so I firstly need to connect this to positive supply so that if I were to connect that to positive supply by pushing the button then it brings the voltage and raises the voltage on the input of the clock here in order to make this actually work properly, we need to have it so that when the bus switch is open, this isn't just floating. The floating input is susceptible to pick up noise from the environment, so uh, electromagnetic interference, and that could be enough to trigger this. So we need to have a pull down resistor to ground or some other voltage in order to make sure that this voltage is zero. Now I can't just use a piece of wire because if you think about what's happening when I close this switch I'm going to be connecting the positive supply directly to ground which will cause a short circuit and um, most likely just cause the voltage on the battery to drop to next to nothing which will power down the entire circuit uh, if it doesn't damage the switch or the battery in the meantime. So we just need a resistance here and generally you choose a very large resistance in the order of 100k or more just to reduce the current required because we're only looking at the voltage here and we just need to um, have some way of pulling that uh, stop that input from floating now if in, in theory this looks great because I can now press the button and make the input go high and when I release the button the input will go of the clock will go back to low again and repeat our cycle. However, in practice it's not quite as simple as that. These switches are never perfect, it's a mechanical device and it's they're subject to something called bouncing. So if you think about how the switches are working, they're effectively two sheets of metal that when we close them go like that and when I open them, or at least like that. But they never actually just close and stay closed. They Sometimes they go dunk, 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 and bounce. Uh, hopefully the frame rate on this video is enough to demonstrate that pretty well. But you can imagine um, if you drop a ball on the floor, it's going to bounce a few times before it settles. It's the same with the metal switches here. It'll bounce a few times uh, before a complete contact is made and that could end up giving us a voltage that on the on this clock pin input here which may not be representative of the number of times I press the button often if I drew the voltage over time it might look like this so it's zero and the time I close the switch so I press the switch with my finger we get a voltage spike up to the supply voltage but it bounces for a moment so it drops again and then up and drops again and up and eventually it will settle. So you can imagine that this clock is susceptible to the same rules as any of our other digital inputs in that it has a threshold voltage which when exceeded it um, registers as a logic 1 and when it is below that it registers as a logic 0. So the digital output of this, if we were to graph it, it would look something like this. So we've got a high and a low again. Then right to the next peak, we get a high and a low again, until we get finally rest and it stays high. So in our bouncing switch example here, we're actually, instead of pressing the button once, which we've done, we're registering three on pulses which is 
not going to be desirable, especially if it's a counter of some sort. Because we're going to register go up by three counts. In this case, it may be an unknown number of counts. It could be uh, one or it could be 30. It, and anywhere in between. You don't know. So the switching, the bouncy of our switch is an undesirable effect. There are a couple of easy ways that we can counter this. Uh, the simplest of all is to simply put a capacitor across our dropping resistor. Okay, like so. Now, if you make that capacitor sufficiently large, it changes the time that the voltage here can change. So it changes how quickly that voltage can change. So if the voltage cannot change very quickly because of that capacitor now has to charge up, then the um, input of our switch no longer looks like this, but it looks like that. And this will now only represent with one switch, uh, one logic pulse rather than several. There are other devices that will do roughly the same sort of thing. A Schmidt trigger is an example. So I could have a Schmidt that debounces it. So let's do a Schmidt buffer. And this then is the input to my uh, flip flop. So the Schmidt buffer there, it requires different voltages to turn on and off. So in this example here, it may still not cover it enough. However, I'll draw another example where it might be fine. So if I've got voltage and time, if it does something like this, then I'll just superimpose on the turn on and turn off voltages. So if the turn on voltage is there and the turn off voltage is there so on off so as soon as it exceeds the, the first time the output is going to go high but if the turn on and turn off voltage were the same if they're both along here then the output would go back low again and then back high and then low again and high at these points where it dips below that voltage however with a Schmidt trigger the voltage between the turn on and the turn off is sufficiently different that this now needs to go down below here in order to turn off again. So we can still deal with a little bit of bouncing um, without it registering several clock pulses. A third type of way, and this is a little bit more in depth, is something called a monostable. So a monostable is a multi vibrator where the um, output is stable in only one state, that is low. However, if you disturb that state, it can go transition to the high state for a short amount of time, or a set amount of time, and then revert back to the low state. And it will ignore any triggering effects in the interim. I'm not going to draw a diagram for that, but the monostable is a method of debouncing. Okay. So we've got our three main methods. By far the easiest is simply um, a capacitor across our dropping resistor. Slightly more uh, complicated version that has a similar effect but may not always work is a Schmidt trigger. And the fourth, the third type is the monostable.